I'm really happy to tell you about this particular building um, this evening. And I want to start as I have found myself starting a number of lectures late, um, lately with a story um, that comes from a 1947 experience at Mount Lebanon. Um, in the late fall of 1947, two reporters ended up showing up at the um, Shakers North family at Lebanon, E.M. Um, e. Forrester and a young reporter named Burton Boucher. Boucher was there under the auspices of the New Yorker magazine to do a story on the Shakers. Um, people had heard that they were about ready to move out of their community and um, close it down for good. And it would be the last um, community in New York State that the Shakers would close and leave. Um, Ian Forrester really um, did not enjoy his experience with the Shakers. He wrote very little about them that was pleasant. But Rouché, as a young man, became totally intrigued, I think, with the people that he met there. He was taken under wing by um, a sister named Jenny Wells. Um, Jenny Wells had been a Shaker much of her life and had moved from various Shaker communities and her um, she had come to Mount Lebanon from the Shaker community at Water Valley. Wells um, got into a time when she was going to show him around the village and they walked out the back door of the dwelling house and down a stone walk towards the great stone barn. He was asking her a lot of questions and she said, you know, you really can't tell Shakerism, you really have to live it. But you can learn a lot about it from that barn. Well, I think tonight we'll see what we can learn about Shakers and Shakerism from the barn um, and a little bit about um, the post-Shaker life of this building. So let us get started. Well, the Shakers at the North family where a family had been founded in, in 1800 to particularly attend the novitiate members coming in to train people and to um, see if they were fit to be shakers and then to send them out generally into other families to live their shaker life. Um, the North family was um, a, a fairly large family in its own right. It had generally between 60 and 70 members. Um, they owned considerable land and had um, a very thriving agricultural um, program. And the, uh, the two men that you see here are two of the most significant elders that um, ran the family and managed the affairs. On the left is Elder Richard Bushnell, who was the elder, as you can see, from 1832 to 1858. Frederick Evans on the right um, became his junior elder in 1838. And then when Bushnell retired, Elder Frederick took over um, to be the family elder from 1858 until sometime in 1891 or two. But why these two people are important is Bushnell was a very tight-fisted money manager for the Shakers. In fact, when he left, I believe he wrote a letter to the ministry explaining all the finances and what he'd done over time. And basically he had left the North family with about $20,000 in assets in the bank, um, which is, I think it's considerable amount of money in 1858. Frederick Evans was an Englishman who had spent some of his early years on an English estate. He had a particular um, attitude about and notion about what a um, an agricultural business should look like um, from his er early days in, in England. And with a, within a, just a few years of when they switched over, um, Elder Frederick really decided to try to remake the North family into something that was more akin to what he was used to in terms of a, a fine and substantial, um, maybe we could call it a fine and substantial English farm. Elder Frederick's first concern was that the barns that the Shakers were using for all different aspects of their um, agriculture were in, I think, rather poor condition. And he made a decision that they should have a new, fine, um, sort of state-of-the-art barn. 
Um, and the whole thing story really starts around January 5th in any kind of way that we can document. But on January 5th, 1859, Elder Frederick, another Shaker brother, George Wickersham, and a third Shaker, Edward Chase, made a trip to Great Barrington to go visit a barn that was owned by a man named David Levitt. Levitt was a, a wealthy um, New York banker who had moved up and bought a 300-acre estate in Great Barrington. And in 1853 and 54, he built himself a mansion and built a barn that was known as Brookside. Brookside was a barn that was um, attracted people from all over the country, and many people incorporated some of his um, some of the features of the Brookside barn. Now, Brookside was a unique barn in that, and I have rather poor pictures of it here, but it was a very large barn. It was built over a ravine so that it actually had a waterfall running through the building to supply um, cattle and machinery with water power. Brookside had a curved roof with a square middle piece of it. It was an extraordinarily long barn. And as you can see from this picture, you could drive a wagon directly from one end and out the other. So it was a typical sort of New England, not typical, but it was a New England bank barn in that you could get up to the upper floors with a wagon and a load of hay, something you could unload um, down into Haymow. Evans and the other Shakers were there to basically take a look at what the, the best barn built in the area looked like and see what they could incorporate into their own experience. It wasn't just the um, Brookside barn, but the Shakers had their own barns. This is a, actually a, a watercolor done by a friend of mine who's an illustrator and artist, um, Bob Brown. Um, Bob has studied Shaker barns and um, historic breeds that the Shakers used for many years. And this is the um, Center family barn at New Lebanon with its <clears throat> wings attached and a couple of Shaker sheep in the foreground. But you get a sense, this barn was built in 1853 by the Shakers. It's an extraordinarily long and large barn, um, but one traditionally made of wood in the way that most Shaker, what we would call great barns were made. The Shakers also had a barn of this one. This one is at Canterbury, New Hampshire. It was built in 1854. So Evans and the crew had a number of barns close at hand or ones that they could travel and study. They could use the knowledge of their other Shaker brothers and um, see what would be best to incorporate into their barn. Evans was probably the, the idea and the pusher behind this. George Wickersham, who accompanied him on his first trip um, to see the, um, the Brookside barn, was apparently a, um, we're going to call him an architect, but one capable of planning buildings and one who understood timber frame construction and other kinds of construction. Um, Wickersham, in 1859, the Shakers noted that, <coughs> excuse me, noted that they had um, had a case of drawers and a cupboard uh, built by a man named Shumway um, working in their workshop. Shumway was not a shaker, but a paid carpenter. And this was in payment um, to, from the North family to the church family where Wickersham was living at the time um, for his service and making a draft of a new barn. And they are, as you can see, calculating to build a barn that year in 1859. Frederick Evans in February, oops, how do I go back? Thank you. Frederick Evans in February of 59, um, Evans and two other Shaker brothers went to Lenox, Massachusetts to buy pine logs um, for construction of the barn. And they also contracted with a man named Oliver P. Tanner to build a barn of stone. So Tanner is, is buried in Lenox, Massachusetts, the Tanner family. Um, many of them were Masons. They did a lot of work on um, things in local things in Lenox. I believe that Oliver Tanner one time owned the Lenox Waterworks. Um, not a man of, um, to be ignored. Tanner took on the project. Um, the price was called $2 a perch, which came out to about a $10,000 project for the masonry construction of the barn. George Wickersham drew drafts of the barn. So here you see the um, drawings of the barn. These are in the, in the New York State Museum collection, the original architectural drawings done by Wickersham. And you can see here his 
plan for the um, the tall facade, which is the west facade, and the short one, which is the east facade, and then also the north and south plans, window planning for the barn. This was all done with field stone quarried on the property by the masons. Um, I think that that quarry is just uphill from the barn, so they would bring the stones down. And basically, um, while they were doing that, doing that construction, the Shaker brothers were doing the timber frame inside the barn and keeping up with the masons to pl supply platforms for them to work on, as well as the structural support for the walls as they went higher and higher. So you can see here just the general, there are eight of these plans all together. I'm going to just share these two with you. I do want to show, pay particular attention to the bottom drawing. And you can see at the left end of the bottom drawing a, a curve. Um, that's going to be a critical part of this whole story about the barn. I just want you to note where it is and that there's a little, um, a little string that connects the curve uh, within that area. This is a curve that actually goes over what the Shakers call the manure vault, and that's the area where they would collect the cow manure um, to be stored and mixed and composted um, to then take out to the fields. So the story in New England is basically New England soil does not really support human life all that well in any quantity, and that um, it is essential that in this area that you have animals which would then eat foliage that humans can't eat. Um, would give you some milk as a byproduct and produce manure, which then you could put on a garden and grow plants that you could eat. Um, so this whole barn is planned around the efficiency and ease of producing a quantity of manure to act as fertilizer so the shakers could not only feed themselves, but they had a thriving business at the North family in producing garden seed. The Shaker Brothers, basically the barn has six sets of um, trusses or six sets of um, beds. And you can see the different formations depending on what they needed. So they would, there were 19 beds in the building altogether. So some combination of these clearly you can see the ones that are above a stone wall um, and the other ones are just freestanding attached. You can see the stone walls on the side and how they're attached. I'm going to give you just a quick outside tour of the barn. I'm sure that many of you have been by it and seen it, but I think just a quick walk around. I do want to just uh, mention that the barn has had some changes made it over made changes made to it over time. So you'll see images that look like two different buildings. Mostly it is that the roof line of the barn was changed from um, a, a three section flat roof to a typical gable end roof. So don't, I, all the same building on us. So if you're coming into the village from the north, we're coming down from the south, the first view you might have of the barn is something like this. It has to be a pretty impressive way to enter a Shaker village. And as you walk around clockwise on the road, you get up close, you see the entrance. Now this is the barn is built into the bank and then it was filled up to this door so that you had a ramp that came off the main road with very little elevation to it. So it was possible there to bring wagons in and out of the barn that basically on the third floor. That's a, a critical piece of how the barn worked. If you walk around a little further, you can see that the door and the ramp is a little bit more obvious. You can see that there's a shed attached to it. And as we go on further around, you can see there are a couple of other sheds. In fact, there are three altogether um, extending out on the south side of the barn. So the south side would be important for these sheds because that's going to be the warmest side of the barn. The sheds create two cow yards where an east cow yard between the first two sheds and a west cow yard between the second two sheds which would be a nice place to let cows out when they can get out and get some fresh air. You can see all three sheds here together in a sort of 1940s historic American building survey photograph. And you notice that all of the sheds have um, little cattle run-ins underneath them. So there's places there for either equipment or allowing cows to get in and out of the weather. Um, you would control that and make that decision. Each one of these sheds, though, also in addition to being able to serve cattle and store equipment, all has a second floor, and each second floor has a particular purpose we'll talk about in a second. 
As you go around, now you see a picture of the barn prior to the change of the roof. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and you can see the west end, the high facade of it, as well as um, the second or the third wester, westerly most um, addition that was put on it, wing put on it. I do want to note at this time that in 18, originally when the barn was built, there were three wings. They were all 60 feet long. And then in 1867, the low wing that you're seeing here in the foreground was added on as an addition because they needed a place to keep their oxen and needed a place to store particularly long ladders and to also dry um, things that they need drying. So this was put up for those three particular purposes and added onto the barn seven years after it was built. As we get back around, you can see this end again. What I we just want to draw your attention to here is that the middle section here, you see the tallest stone section, then there's a wooden section, and then the part that I said was the new edition, the 1876 edition. The one in the middle, in fact, what you're looking at there is a corn crib. And that will, will, that will play into the story here a little bit later. And as we get back, you see um, the barn sort of from the looking south from north of the barn. It's 196 feet long, 50 feet wide, and um, I believe 62 feet at its height at the west end. And that's probably prior to the gable roof right there. How the barn worked, this is a floor plan that I've sort of altered from the Historic American Building Survey. You can see that um, the, on the right hand side, we're looking at the cattle floor. So you're seeing both um, the box stalls for milking and the wider stalls on the far right, which would have been probably calving pens. Um, and up at the top of that, I just want you to note the little arc again going around and the, it's labeled manure pit. You can see the two sheds at the very top, the ox sheds, the drying room above with the lavish storage behind it and the cattle shelter below with the corn crib above it. The middle shed is, um, has, is both for equipment and cattle underneath, but there is a, at the far end, there is a milk cooler for um, storing milk until it was taken to the creamery. And then also above that, the second story of that was particularly used for storing straw for cattle bedding. And the third smaller thing, the smaller um, wing on the, um, on the eastern side at the bottom of this picture was basically used as a cattle run in and for storage of equipment. In the cross section, it's a little bit more clear about how the building was used. A couple of things I want to point out. You can see that the cattle stalls were on the right and left hand side of the bottom floor. So that's really the feeding the cattle floor and milking floor. Um, the floor above it, where it says middle story hay mow, actually was the floor that I would call the feeding floor, in that hay was stored on both sides of that with an alley down the middle. Um, and the hay mow in the middle of the barn was 130, basically 130 feet long and two stories high. I believe it holds about 600 tons of hay. And hay could be cut from the hay mow and passed down through wooden chutes that would fall into feeders in front of each of the cows. Um, there was also water supplied to the barn. Um, so cattle had both feed and um, water coming right to their stalls. You note that the framing of the barn is narrow at the bottom. There's a point at which the timber frame in the center flares out towards the, uh, out a little bit and then the posts go up. This allows for the driveway floor on the third floor, which is where hay wagons could come in and unload to be a little bit wider so you could get a bigger um, bigger wagon in there, and yet on the bottom floor, you want as much room for the cattle as possible. So by keeping them narrow them um, narrow at the bottom, or larger at the bottom for the cattle, and then um, narrowing them up to the hay mow and allowing you to have a good driveway, it gives you the ability to come down through there. So we've had a little outside tour, looked at how the barn functions, and I think what I'd like to do now is take a little inside look. So if you just open the main door and look down the barn, um, 
I think what you see, this is the drive floor. So this is where a hay wagon could come in. There's some walls along the side and hay would be pitched off the wagon over that wall down one story and then filled up. It could be filled up right up to the rafters of the, um, the, the building on either side. Wagons could continue down to where you see the windows and that floor down there then broadens out to the full width of the barn. You could actually turn a wagon around in that space and bring it back out the barn. You didn't have to, to detach a wagon and push it back out. Um, the Shakers had a number of ways of dealing with getting wagons out of barns. Sometimes, like the, um, the Brookside barn, you'd be able to drive through completely through the barn. Sometimes you had to roll the wagon back. But in this case, you could actually, or at Hancock, you could drive completely around a circle around the round barn and leave through the door you came in. This way, you would turn the wagon around inside the barn and drive out the door. The other two features down here at the far end of the barn, which we don't have an interior photograph, is there's a trap door at the very end of the barn, which would allow you to bring in muck, which the, the shakers would go and harvest, dig up, and haul with ox carts up from a swamp that was down um, below their property, on their property, but down the mountain from them. They would bring swamp muck, which was rich with nutrients, up and dump it down that two stories down into the manure pit where it could be mixed in with the manure to enrich it and to really form more of a compost rather than just raw manure. The other thing at the end is on the left-hand side of that, down at the far end, there was a chute that allowed you to bring a wagon in full of corn and just shovel it directly into the corn, corn, um, into the corn bin. So that's the drive floor. And if you're standing down where I mentioned that the turnaround was and looking, you're seeing the doors to the barn, the planking on the floor and some of the framing of the barn here. These, this photograph was taken in 1957. A friend of mine who is an architect happened to do a college paper on this project and got into the barn in 1957 and took a series of interior photographs, which are incredibly valuable for us in understanding the framing and just sort of the general look of the barn. And we've learned a couple of interesting things. One of which, this is the bottom of the hay mow. You can see how the framing flares out to make the wider um, drive floor. And so this would have been where the, the bottom of the hay mow and it would have been stacked up as, as high as you can see there. Um, standing here on the, on the, um, on that, what I would call the feeding floor or the bottom of the hay mow. Um, you can look up and you can see the framing and the, how strong the flooring was for the drive floor above it. What I wanted to also pay attention to is on the right hand side, you see a slanted stretch of boards. That was a chute that you could empty um, straw down and that straw would go into that the upper floor, that second, um, that middle wing, that middle wing in order to um, store it for bedding. And then right below it, there are horizontal boards. That is a passageway that was basically a tunnel. That once that got covered over, over with hay, you could still get through there to the wing to bring straw out to be thrown down as bedding for the animals. One of the um, common complaints about stone barns is that the stone in different weathers would sweat and would um, mold the hay. Um, that came up against it and the hay could turn bad pretty quickly. Um, the shakers, one of the great things we have information about from um, the photographs that were taken is that the shakers did all along this where the hay mow was, um, the, or the hay loft was, the shakers put up vertical boards in order to keep um, the hay away from the stone wall. You can see the boards there. I need a pointer. A very bad picture. Another person that I know was in the barn in 1972. This was so fascinated by this. And um, at a point, the Shakers changed their box stalls over to stanchions, as most milk, most dairy farmers did. And here you have a set of um, stanchions. And there was always a story that the Shakers 
named their cows, wrote their names above uh, about their stalls or their stanchions. And when the cows came in, they knew where to go because shaker cows, of course, could read. But um, cows are creatures of habit. And you can see on the left hand side, this was star number nine, or maybe 29 or 19. I'm not sure what the number really is. I can see a nine there. So that was stars stanchion. And the other one is totally illegible at this point. Maybe someday I'll see the original photograph and we'll know who that cow was. Now to the little, what I call the manure railroad. I mentioned that looping thing around and this is um, some photographs were taken of it. This is, um, you can see the, <clears throat> the curve part of this with the rails have, having been removed. Um, at some point, the shakers replaced the rails with an overhead um, manure um, a, a, with a dump car that would slide on rollers above overhead so you could just sort of push it along. It still had a dumping mechanism to dump down below this into the manure pit. But we do have some photographs that show um, portions of the rails. You saw that one little sort of the um, string of the bow that went across between the connected the curves. Um, you can see here there's a turntable so that you could actually put a manure cart, which you see on the right hand side, just a little box cart. Um, you could put that on the turntable, turn it and cut across and dump it out so that you get an even more even distribution of manure on the floor of the manure pit. Here's a little bit better picture of the cart and the rails going across, which are apparently left in place. A very efficient system, I think, when you think about um, the option is loading up wheelbarrows and bringing them down and dumping them over the edge and then having to push it around, distribute it. So I just want to take a look at um, the North family in general, the placement of the, of the stone barn. You can see it here. Maybe this is a time to just note that when the Shakers built the building, they originally planned it with the clear story on top and the three flat roofs. Um, that was designed meant for ventilation. If you see that, um, the picture of it with a clear story, you notice that it's window vent, window vent, window vent, all the way down on the clear story on both sides so that there'd be a lot of um, ventilation leaving the barn. Um, a caution you always take when you have hay that might be damp, you don't want it to overheat, you want it to be able to be ventilated. The roofing system that the Shakers put on in 1859 when they built the barn um, was a new system. It was a, a combination of using felted paper and a felt like paper and tar and covering the whole thing with sea gravel. The Shakers actually drew 50 tons of sea gravel from the Connecticut coast. Um, I guess sea gravel because it was round. I don't know why that's any better than um, river gravel that they might be able to get early, but they dragged it up from Connecticut. Um, so the roof was um, tar paper and covered with gravel to protect it. As in by 1879, um, the Shakers had made a comment that, that flat roofs had had their day and the flat roof on the stone barn was failing badly. And between 1880 and 1881, they changed it over to a typical um, gable roof with slate shingles on it and replaced the ventilated um, the ventilators along the clear story with a large cupola that people described as a two-story cottage. You can see that at this point, sometime shortly after 1947, that there's still two sheds left on the barn. The, um, the long shed had been torn down by that point. Eventually, the easternmost or the upper shed on this was um, torn down as well. And um, the history of the middle shed we'll share with you in a moment. My friend, my friend Bob Brown, who um, did, a, did the illustration of the center family barn of the sheep, also did a sketch for me one day of what he, how he conceived the North family property would have looked in um, around 1871. We know that the little red building in the, on the left side with the white dots, which are chickens, 
um, in front of it was built in 1870, and everything else in this picture predates that time. So you have in the front, you have the chicken coop and you have the Shaker's horse barn with a long wagon shed coming out to the right. The yellow building behind it, their granary where they stored grain. Um, the building on the left behind the red chicken coop was a, a, a gardener's, um, gardeners, the garden house where gardeners stored their tools and equipment. And then the uh, large barn behind it with some of the shed visible. One of the interesting things about um, the North family is there happened to be a particular place where everyone could stand and get a good view of the North family. It's on a stone walk that runs along the main road. Um, this is a view done by artist Benson um, Lossing. In 1856, he visited the Shakers and he happened to do a sketch of the North family from that walkway. And you can see between the building on the far right and the next one on over on the left that there's just nothing but trees through there. What's missing there is the great stone barn. So we wouldn't expect to see it there, and certainly we don't. We don't see, in fact, very many barn buildings at all. Um, the frame building, the building that looks like it's just timber frame, in fact, is was um, the deacon's workshop and office, and it was, in fact, greatly enlarged in 1856. So he happened to catch that moment when the Shakers were actually doing construction and caught that on with his pencil. What I wanted to note here was prior to that, and it probably would have made sense, this is a plan done in 1839 of the North family. Um, the do you see my cursor? I don't know. This building here that you see is the dwelling house. That's what we were looking at. We were looking from this walk up here down through here towards the barn. And where you see at the bottom, it says gardens. That's where the Shakers, in fact, selected to put the stone barn. So that's the location they chose and about where it ended up in about the right size. But Frederick Evans made a note in his journal that when they constructed the barn, they were able to take down 14 inferior buildings and combine all those things into, um, into what they were using in the barn itself. A photographer, James Irving, standing in about the same place as um, Benson Lawson was standing. You see the stone walk over to the, on the right-hand side of each of these photographs. And then if you look carefully, through the middle, you can see, oops, sorry, back again. Through between the dwelling house on the right and the building on the left, you can see just a hint of um, the stone barn with its original flat roof and the clear story above. I won't dwell on this picture, it is hard to look at. And then sometime in the early 1890s, James, I'm sorry, I bet the wrong guy. James West, another photographer, was here and he took a picture from about the same spot. And you can see by 1890, the roof has been changed. You can see the gable roof with the slate on it and a little cupola on top of the barn. So we have really nice documentation through photographs and drawings of what the property would look like and the changing days of the barn. What I wanted to mention before I actually went to this next slide was that the barn took 18 months to build. The masons worked on the masonry work. Um, the Shaker brothers did the, the woodwork. Um, I'm sure that there were people in the workshops busily making windows and doors and all of the other materials were necessary to be put in once the masons got done. But they did the whole thing in 19 months. The barn was started in the beginning of January and it was completed and the cows were moved in on the day that Lincoln was elected president. In 1947, this was the year that the Burton Rouché came to visit. Um, and the woman that he spoke with was the one second from the left, Jenny Wells. And these were the last seven Shakers to live in New York State. They were all residents of the North family. And this picture was taken shortly before they all were moved out. A couple went to live in nursing homes. A couple went to live at Hancock. One went to live at um, the community Canterbury. When the Shakers left, 
Um, the barn kept being used by um, local people, either renting it or by agreements. The Shakers still owned the property. They were in the process of trying to buy a buyer um, for, for about three or four years. And this is a photograph taken of um, the last time that hay was baled and put into the barn. They just happened to have the baler set up at the bottom west end of the barn. Um, and one of the men in the picture, I believe the man with the back is Artie Kep, and Artie was a friend who lived to be 101 years old and didn't remember the day that he was bailing hay with the shakers. The other two people are related to him. Um, it's obscuring what I want you to see, but this is that another view of the um, the Shaker Village taken about about 1950-53. And in fact, the Shakers were looking for purchaser for the villa, entire village. They ended up selling it to a man named um, a Reverend Vogt, who was um, determined to set up a Christian orphanage and evangelical center at the North Family. The Shakers were pleased with that purpose, thought that it would do a lot of good and both um, put out this brochure with a picture of it on it's called lebanon boys village um, it was supposed to house a number of boys educate them and train them in particular crafts and trades as well as agriculture he did think that the barn was probably unnecessary for farming he thought it would make a wonderful evangelical center and comments in his first newsletter to try to drum up support that it, with a neon light on top of it, it would be seen from all up and down the Lebanon Valley. Both plans um, materialized in that he did have residents come in for a while. They did use the property for a couple of years, but he failed to get sufficient support for the project and eventually went into bankruptcy and the building came up for sale. The buildings came up for sale again they were purchased by a man named Hugh Spawn, who was a um, financial person for the General Electric Company. Spawn bought this property and a number of acres of land that went with it. And while he owned it in 1972, the barn had a terrific fire, horrific fire. Late on the night, about two o'clock in the morning, um, there was a fire alarm sounded and the um, New Lebanon Volunteer Fire Department um, came up to fire, find the fire, the barn fully engulfed in flames. Um, Albert Wheelers, whose name um, appears in the middle of this article in the second column, was the fire chief at the time. I just have to add that he's also was a justice of the peace and married me and my wife. But Albert told me that when they got to the barn, it was very obvious that it had been arson. Um, no one ever found out who, but he said the smell of um, gasoline was incredibly strong and the way that the barn burned and it took off, it could not have been just natural causes. Luckily, somebody got up at two o'clock in the morning, took a couple of photographs of the barn. What you're seeing here is flames coming out the roof of the barn and the center shed, the only remaining shed, now totally engulfed in flames as well. The fire department got there. They found that they had to run hoses, that the hydrants that were close, there was actually a hydrant within, um, short, you could throw a baseball to it from the barn, but it was dry and was useless. So they had to run hoses about a half a mile up the road to a pond. Um, and that inhibited them. I, he didn't, Albert didn't think they could have saved the barn anyway, but um, the frustration was in seeing it just get worse and worse all the time. Basically, the building and all its contents were a total loss. I say total in that all the wooden structures were burned beyond um, any kind of salvage. And all the content, we don't know really what was in the barn when it burned. And this photograph was taken um, the morning after the fire. You can still see smoldering ashes and some other structures. Cattle stanchions, burnt timbers. 
In the fire, um, one thing that somebody pointed out to me was that they said if the fire had smoldered for a long time, it would be likely that the walls would have been blacker. Um, they tended to be a very hot fire that just took all the smoke and soot right off the top of the barn. Another view. And the center shed. So the barn burned and it stood there from 1972 until 1979. And in 1979 in June, the, the owner of the barn, who Swan, decided to put it an 11 acres of land up for sale. Um, he had given or sold or a combination of both the, re the rest of the North family property to the Darrow School, who was the neighbor immediately to the south of the North family. And um, so Darrow was, had taken over the rest of those buildings and they were using those for residential buildings and an art center at that time. But he, Swan had held on to the barn, I think, without knowing what his intentions were for it. Um, he ended up auctioning it off. And I believe in that that time, it and the 11 acres of land were bought by the Darrow School. So during the time that the school owned the property, um, there was a proposal made to turn the barn into a theater, an outdoor theater. A couple had come up here and decided it would be a worthy project. Um, they developed a comp set up a company to do it, a not-for-profit. They, in fact, got some money advanced to them, and they hired some local masons to come in and do some really elementary structural work to try to piece some of the masonry work back together. Um, and this is that crew working. And this is in 1984 is when this work began. If you've been up to the barn, you've seen these large iron um, beams um, braces against the south wall of the barn. That was also when those were put up to stabilize and hold that wall in place. Um, the only problem with this work is mostly what of it was done with non-compatible cement mortar rather than what traditionally should have been used. So a lot of that um, did not do all that well in holding things together and became a problem when real restoration work needed to be done. This is the general plan for the theater. There was a stage and seating and backup house ideas. It seems like a very viable plan. They had lovely fundraisers and auctions and were able to raise some money, but in the end, were never really able to raise enough money. And once again, the barn goes into limbo. And basically sat there vacant until um, 2002. Um, the Shaker Museum was approached and asked whether it would be interested in acquiring the North family. The museum for that at that period had been um, considering for about a decade um, the idea of building a new museum. The barn buildings that it had been using since 1950 were getting to be pretty hard to keep up and maintain. They were not particularly ADA compliant and um, were, would have been almost impossible to to make environmentally um, environmentally good for collection storage, collection exhibition. So the Shaker Museum did a study um, with help from Save America's Treasure Grant from 2002 to 2004. They did a study about the viability of moving to Mount Lebanon and reusing the buildings. One of the things it focused on is whether the barn could be turned into a museum building. In the end, we found out that indeed it could, that the cost was between 40 and $50 million and really couldn't be phased. And that was a project much more expensive than the museum was able to take on. Um, in 2004, the Shaker Museum got involved with the World Monuments Fund. The World Monuments Fund um, um, designated Great Stone Barn as one of its world sites. And um, helped us raise money to, um, to run a series of preservation training, traditional building field schools. The first year we did one on timber framing and the second year um, 
second and third year, we did one on masonry preservation and focused on the stone barn. You can see the traditional building historic preservation field school, Mount Levin Jacob Village, and students from that field school working on the east end top of the barn at the exterior masonry investigating, sampling. By this time, the nice thing about the 2002 to 2004 period is that the building got every kind of possible study it could have. We had photogrammetry done, which means that you have incredibly detailed, you could take the building apart and put the exterior back stone for stone. The detail of the photographs were so incredibly um, high resolution. We also had it um, surveyed and mapped, um, digital mapping done. Um, we had test pits done to see what the found, how deep the foundation went. In fact, it sits on bedrock. Um, we discovered that kind of thing. Then we did all of the uh, part of the Save America's Treasure Grant let us do an analysis of the mortar and um, any paint samples left in the building. And um, so we had all that information to go forward. Plus what the field school added to it and the work that they did. Um, so when the field school started, we ended up bringing in scaffolding to scaffold part of the building so we could get up on it and really take a better look at it, the erection of the scaffolding. And um, this is um, one of the students here experimenting with the correct kind of um, mortar, mortar to do parging on the interior of the, of the walls of the barn to see, you can see some of it still existing on the right-hand side of this photograph. Much of it had fallen off uh, because of intrusion of water. The biggest problem with the barn is because it didn't have a roof on it. The walls had not been properly capped as it moisture got into it. And it, the kind of mortar that was used actually washes out with sufficient water and rain coming through it over the period of time. Initially, when they built the building, the walls would have been laid up two parallel walls with a space in between them. Yeah, every once in a while, the interior and exterior walls would have been locked together by head, stone headers. Um, but in a typical wall like this, there would have been probably a 20% void in the middle anyway. And that void had grown um, considerably from the washing out of, of mortar as um, rain infiltrated. So we're experimenting with some of the reparging of the building. Um, we had done, we had taken scopes so you could look inside the building and calculate the amount of void in it. And the proposal for the long-term preservation of the barn was to actually inject a um, compatible grout mortar into all of those empty spaces, basically glue the building together from the inside and, um, and make sure that it would be, in fact, probably stronger than the, when the masons built it originally. You're filling up voids that the masons never took the time to fill up. The World Monuments Fund, of course, um, we we brought them up to see the progress on the project and did a wonderful hard hat tour with them. Um, some of their major donors and people that supported this. And at the end of it all, we took them for a nice lunch with the artist Ellsworth Kelly at his house. Um, and they were very pleased and um, continued to support the museum for several years after this. All of that work that we did, all of the things that we learned from the field school, all of the studies and the surveys that were done, um, all netted us the ability to write about two, over $2 million worth of grants to have the building stabilized. Um, not reconstructed, but to have the masonry work re stabilized. And this is the very beginning of that process. So for this process, we brought in a company that was a special, that had um, the specialty of being able to do grout injection under pressure. And you have to be careful not to put too much pressure on and blow the walls apart. So there's a lot of monitoring that goes on. So they did their own surveys, looked at the walls. They found that that very top part of the barn was so fragile, it really needed to be taken down completely. We took it apart, stored it, and then it eventually you'll see got put back together. The entire interior of the barn, first the south side and then the north side, got scaffolded up to the top. This is the changeover. Here we're changing from the um, south side of the barn to the north side of the barn. Um, and while they had the scaffolding up, about 10,000 holes were drilled through the, um, the mortar into the interior parts of the bar barn and grout injected to re-cement the walls together. 
gave me a chance to climb up high on the scaffolding. And here they're building that upper highest wall and peak on the barn. I do want to stop and tell one little story about the barn here. This is one of the windows that was, I had mentioned the corn crib. This is one of the chutes that you could shovel corn down and it had a wooden surround at one point. This would have been a chute that went directly into the corn crib. What happened here sometime in the 19, late 1970s is um, a number of a uh, small group of ravens took up residence and built a nest in here, which is to this day still there. But the masons had to disassemble the raven's nest in order to do their work. Um, and so we moved the nest out. The ravens who were going to raise their young just decided the fair trade was to use the scaffolding to build a new nest. So this is the ravens raving, raising their babies on the scaffolding. As soon as the scaffolding came down, they rebuilt the nest in the same window. And to this day, if you go up there, you'll see the nest and see the raven. Hey, I'm um, very excited for the day that we can actually get into the barn and do the tour. Interested in what will happen to the building in time, whether it will be preserved as a substantial ruin or in fact, something else will happen over time. I think that's yet, the story yet to be told.